um, was one of those kids who would rush on Sunday mornings to get the Sunday New York Times, you know, when it was about a half a foot thick. And I would go through the arts and leisure section looking for the Ninas, and then I would go to the book review. And that was my idea of what being a successful artist was having a book in the New York Times book review. But I was frankly just scared of the blank page. And I happened to have a facility. My brother and sister would say basically I was just bossy, but I made up stories and I made them into plays. And I would cast my brother and sister, I would cast my friends, whoever I could rope in to doing something would end up working on these productions with me. And so becoming a director was a very natural evolution. Um, when I got to Wesleyan, which is where I went to undergrad, um, I started a, um, an, a student run theater. So I had a huge playground to develop plays, uh, direct as much as I wanted. I went to England and I spent two years in England really apprenticing and um, in London, you know, particularly at that time, you could see, you could see three productions of Measure for Measure in London at the same time. And the reason that they did that with the classics is that they really believed in the power of the director to interpret those plays in different ways depending on the director's vision. And that really excited me. That was the kind of theater I wanted to do. So um, I would say uh, characters in extremely high stakes situations with a kind of epic backdrop of political and social and moral questions. So Shakespeare, the Greeks, Ibsen, Brecht, certainly, though those were my my ten, my touchstones as as a director. And when I came back to the States, I discovered now you're lucky in Chicago, you have very, very good theater. Um, but it's it's there is no government funding on that level in America, but, uh, as there is in London. And so I sort of quickly realized after I graduated from Yale Drama School, which was a wonderful experience, but I realized making a living that way was not going to be quite as easy as I thought. And so I dipped my toe in film um, and, I, and I loved it. And I ended up very quickly working uh, as a television director on a lot of shows and um, it was very rewarding financially. I developed skills, I developed, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, wonderful relationships with different actors that I would work with. But I really started to feel like these are not my stories. These are the stories of whoever is running this show. And I can make them better, you know? If they're really good, I can make them maybe great in the way I direct them. But if I don't connect to the material, it's just, I don't wanna say it's just a job. That sounds very snobby because really having a job right now is very, very important. But I felt like I wasn't really tapping into the full, um, creative strength that I had. And so I began to play with writing fiction and writing screenplays. And I was going back and forth. I actually went back to school. I got an MFA in fiction because I was quite serious about it. But every time I would really sit down and try to clear my desk to start a big project like a novel, I'd get a call and it would be some opportunity to direct in, you know, Mexico or in Budapest. And I'd just go, oh, well, that's a once in a lifetime experience. So I would just get sort of roped back 
into directing like like the godfather you know they every time i'm out they pull me back in and finally i just i had found the story of lisa meitner and i'll just give you a quick description of how i found that so you understand um how i connected to it um i was in the new york public library um, I was curious about um, having two characters meet on the day that we, uh, that the war ended, that World War II ended. And so I called up the microfiche from the New York Times that reported the day we bombed Hiroshima. And it was fascinating. You know, huge banner headlines, Truman vows reign of ruin, X hundred thousand Japanese killed. And then, because the whole project had been done in secret, the Manhattan Project was so secret that even scientists who worked at Los Alamos did not necessarily know what they were working on. Only the very inner circle really knew. Um, the New York Times had to catch the entire world up on what this was, this bomb. And this history was unfolding and I got to below the fold, a little paragraph, it said the key component that allowed the allies to develop the bomb was brought to us by a female non-Aryan physicist. And I just sat like that up in my chair and I thought, what? How? First of all, a female physicist in, in the 30s, that in and of itself is remarkable. I knew non-Aryan meant Jewish. She had lived in Berlin. She was Austrian. There was no name. And the minute I read that paragraph, I thought there's such a story here. I have to find who this woman is and I have to figure out how to tell her story. And for about 10 years, that was my mission. Between other things, I would go off and direct. I was raising my daughter. I was writing other screenplays, but I was researching who this woman was, what her story was, and then I got very deeply involved in this race between the Allies and the Germans to develop the bomb. What was going on at Los Alamos and the, and the kind of, um, this, this uneasy alliance between the military and the scientists. And it was all bubbling up and I was writing madly in notebooks everywhere. And I just wasn't sure if this story was going to be a screenplay or a novel. And I finally decided when I had a, a frankly very disappointing experience, I had written a wonderful screenplay about the women air service pilots in World War II. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them, but they were the women that were handpicked by Eleanor Roosevelt and Jacqueline Cochran, who was for most flyers probably the best pilot um, maybe ever, certainly the best American pilot. And they were serving uh, as military, um, not, not in combat, but they were ferrying planes, they were towing targets, they were basically target practice for these young GIs that were shooting at them. And 36 of them lost their lives in the line of duty. And, um, and they were never given military benefits and they were never given military funerals. And it was a beautiful story about these unsung women who developed this incredible camaraderie together and supported each other while fighting both inside and outside, fighting the war and also fighting the men who didn't believe that they could do, you know, that they could even fly a plane. And it was poised for production. I had Nicole Kidman, I had Cameron Diaz attached. And finally, the studio said the budget's too high and we're not going to make it. And it broke my heart. And, I, and here I had this other woman that I'd been learning about and sort of nurturing in my imagination. And I thought, 
I cannot go through this. I cannot put her. She's already been lost in history for way too long. If I put her in a screenplay and that screenplay sits for 10 years and then somebody says, you know, oh, sorry, we're not gonna make that film because it has a female lead. I, I would be doing such a disservice to her and I decided I would write it as a novel. And it was a big turning point for me. I left California, I came back to New York, which is where I grew up. I told my agent who was not happy to turn down every single job that I was offered, not even to tell me about them so I wouldn't be tempted. I cleared my desk, except for all the huge research books about atomic physics. And, um, and I had lived with this story for so long that I wrote it in about nine months. And You're answering all my questions before oh, no. I even get to answer, ask well, them. I can take a break and, <laughs> and you can ask me more questions. I can talk for a long time. So That's okay. nine months manuscript, I will say no more. Then go ahead, Hillary. So do you think that um, Hannah, Lizzie, she had sort of the same fate as the um, women from Hidden Figures, the ones who, who helped with getting the first uh, shuttle up into space? I, I think that there are great similarities. I think that, and I admire the Hidden Figures women enormously, but Lisa Meitner was a once in a lifetime genius. I mean, which is not to say that what the Hidden Figures women wasn't, did wasn't incredible, it was. But Lisa Meitner was the only woman working in the entire Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. That was the biggest and most prestigious research institute in the world. So there, there, were, there weren't three of her banding together. It was her alone. And um, she did have a partner, a man named Otto Hahn. They had been collaborating. He was a chemist and she was a physicist and mathematician. So he would do the experiments, but she was the one who would figure out what had happened as a result of the experiment and then would re sort of uh, design the next experiment to address the things that she had found in the previous one. And as the Nazis were rising in power, all of her colleagues said, you know, you are untouchable. You're at the most prestigious institute. You're working at this high, high level. You're one of a kind. We will not let anything happen to you. And when Austria was annexed, she had six hours to leave the country. Nobody stepped up to help her. In fact, one of the scientists actually called the Gestapo and told them where she was. And she fled to Sweden. Now, Otto Hahn stayed in Germany and he couldn't work without her. I mean, he literally could not do his work without her. So he met with her in secret in Copenhagen and they designed experiments. He would go back, he would do the experiments and he would send the results on postcards via courier to her in Sweden and she would figure out what had happened. And she had this very puzzling postcard with this experiment that did not make sense. He had no idea what to make of it and I love this because it's such a film moment. She was cross country skiing with her nephew and she stopped in the middle of the forest and with her ski pole, she started writing equations in the snow. And she said, I know what happened. The only way to account for this result is if he actually split the atom. And so she coined the phrase, she figured it out, and he published the paper in Germany. And because she was Jewish, he did not put her name on it. 
because it would have been discredited as what they called Jewish physics, which the Nazis immediately discounted. And, um, and so as a result of that, and as a result of his decision, either, either, either he convinced himself that he really had done the whole thing himself, you know, which certainly some people manage to do that, you know, um, and the fact that her name wasn't on the paper, he ended up getting the Nobel Prize and she was in the audience and I read her diaries. And the thing, this was the thing I think that made me feel so close to her. She wrote, I can't believe that he didn't even mention my name. And I thought in that moment of every woman in every meeting who's, you know, politely raising a hand, I have an idea. And it sort of, she says the idea, it kind of goes by and 10 minutes later, a man has the idea and suddenly what a great idea. And it's credited of course to him. And there was something that was so poignant about that to me and the way she had to kind of come to accept that. Um, and, I, and I do think that it was in part because she was so passionate about the work that, that for her, it, it really wasn't about the credit. I mean, of course, she would have liked to have gotten credit for her own discovery, but the work had been so important for her and the beauty of the work she was so committed to that, that, that there was part of her, I think, that felt like that, that will be enough for me. But it didn't feel like enough for me. And I decided that other people should know what she had done, so. Do you think you were drawn to Hannah, be, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, but drawn to her because the field that you were in, screenwriting and film directing, was not an easy industry for women to, to get into and to be successful in. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, when I went out to Hollywood, you know, I had one of those wonderful Jewish fathers who just thought I could do anything. And so I went out and I was fearless and I had confidence and boom, did I hit that brick wall. And I thought, it must be me, there must be something wrong with me. And I'd go at it again and again and again. And then I realized it was not about me because I, there were other women having the same experience. It was that Hollywood was not a very welcoming place for women in general, um, but particularly for women who were asking for, I don't wanna say power, directing is not a power trip for me, but you certainly are in charge. You're in charge of big budgets, you're in charge of probably 60 men on a crew. Now there are women also, but at that time it was all men. And, and all of this technical stuff, you know, the cameras and the lights. And so it's like the three things that men don't wanna think women can do, you know, handle a lot of money, handle big technical things, and, you know, and be a leader in, in battle, because when you go to make a film, in a sense, you are going to battle and everyone is supposed to be following you in. And so I had no doubt that I could do it. I was very comfortable when I got to do the work. What was hard was, was getting the jobs and convincing people to give me a shot. Um, and, so, you know, when I read about Lisa Meitner, who she has a great, you know, we all think the word feminist, you know, is so like from, from the, the 70s, but she says, you know, when, when you are known as the woman that the chemistry department did not want to hire, you become a feminist and you stay a feminist for the rest of your life. 
So yes, I really did have a sense of how much she had had to prove, in her case, not only as a woman, but also as a Jew. Um, and I also had a sense of um, what, you know, obviously I've seen a lot of, I've read a lot of books, I've seen a lot of films that are set in Germany in the 30s. But what intrigued me about her was that she was so attached to her collaboration, which really was one of a kind. And she had worked so hard to get to where she was that I think it was almost impossible for her to imagine leaving. And so when her colleagues were saying, don't worry, don't worry, you know, we'll take care of you, you'll be fine. I know there was a part of her that didn't completely believe that or trust that because she writes about that in her diaries. She says, looking back, I realized I should have left much sooner, but she had worked so hard to get where she was and she knew she could never really duplicate that situation. There's a lot of pressure on scientists if you haven't done your great work by the age of 30, you're not gonna do it. So I think that that was at work there also. And I identified with all of that, very much did, so. Did she stay in Sweden throughout the whole, you know, when she left Germany? Is that where she remained for the rest she, of the time? So the she did, um, she did. She, they wanted her very much to come to Los Alamos. Um, and she was very adamant about not going because she did not want to work on a bomb. She knew the potential of what she had discovered, and she was only interested in the um, the part that would benefit um, mankind and that would make the world a better place. So she stayed in Sweden. She did other important work, but not on that scale, nothing of that magnitude. Um, she does have an element named after her, Mytnarium. Um, she did, and I do love this story. She did come to the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt invited her to a women's press club lunch after the war. And Truman was supposed to give her the introduction. And he came up, and I always, as I was saying before we started, you know, she, Lisa Meitner looks like Ruth Bader Ginsburg a little bit. She's, you know, she's tiny. She's got these tiny little wrists with these sort of lace cuffs and lace collar and, and these big eyes, you know, where she knows she's taking in everything and a big, big brain, but very diminutive. And Truman stood up and he said, well, well, well. So you're the little lady who started this whole atomic mess. And I just imagine her kind of trying not to roll her eyes at that backhanded compliment. And, you know, and then she was awarded a medal. But, but this, she was used to it by then, you know, she was, she was used to it. So in the character of Hannah, since you were so drawn to Lisa, are there parts of you in Hannah? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, people have mentioned, you know, Hannah is a very, um, she's a bit of a mysterious character because she is hiding secrets. Of course, it turns out that everybody in the entire story is hiding secrets. So she's not the only one, but, um, but she's guarded. She does not give herself away emotionally. You know, she is very dedicated to her work and she has a certain amount of energy and she's really clear that she cannot waste time with trifling romances or, you know, Love is a different story, you know, if it's the real thing, maybe. But, and, and there is a lot of me in there, for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I 
I love my daughter and my daughter, but my daughter and work are the things that really have motivated me in, in life. So yes, um, yes, there is quite a lot of me in there. So her, her uncle and her cousin, were those real characters? I mean, or were those made up? No, I fictionalized them. Um, I essentially, um, part of the story that takes place in Germany in terms of her progression at Kaiser Wilhelm and the papers and how they were published, that is all true to the real woman. But I made a different backstory for her because I knew that I was not actually writing a biography. There are several really good biographies of Lisa Meitner and that was not my goal at all. Um, so I knew very early on that I was going to fictionalize um, a lot of things about her. But, um, but one thing that was true that uh, her father dying um, in the war was true. Uh, Lisa Meitner's father was um, not a doctor, he was a, a lawyer, and he died in World War I. And that was both, of course, tragic for her because he was a big inspiration, but also it saved her because any, for, for a long time, if you were uh, part of the family of a World War I veteran on the side of the Germans, you even if you were Jewish, you were you were considered German first, and so the Nuremberg Laws, which you know I ended up studying in some detail, um, and I would just say you know I found them chillingly reminiscent of what some of the things that are happening today. You know what what the Nuremberg Laws did was was they chipped away so slowly at Jewish rights. So for instance, you know, you could, you could go buy bread from particular bread vendors on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then maybe a month later, it would be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to three. And then a couple of months later, it would be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to 1, and then only Friday. So, I mean, every time something changed, people adapted. It wasn't as if all of a sudden there was this huge oppression, all these laws came into being, and everybody went, what's going on? It was so slow. And I like to remind people that you know, now we're in the middle of COVID, right? And we're thinking about COVID, we're thinking about Black Lives Matter, which has suddenly risen to the fore. But just a year ago, or a year and a half, we were all talking about separating families at the border. And I barely hear a word about that now, even from my most politically aware friends. And I think the point is that these outrages, you think in the moment, oh my God, this is outrageous. Surely this cannot stand. And then another outrage, and another outrage, and another outrage, and you forget about that one. It's human nature. You adapt because you need to buy your bread. And if you have to go on Friday between 12 and 1 to this one place, you figure out how to do it. And I think that's important for people to understand because, you know, I've, I've heard a lot and, and maybe you have as well, you know, how, how is it possible that these Jews stayed in Germany and how could they not have seen what was going on and why didn't they leave? And I feel like I understand that very, very, very clearly, having put myself in Hannah's shoes and in the shoes of her uncle and in the shoes of her cousin, who's a different, you know, her cousin's younger, her cousin's a teenager, teenagers think that they're going to live forever. So her cousin is much, you know, she's not as careful. She's just rebellious and angry. 
um, because she's at a different point in her life. And so it's, it's not that there weren't people fighting. There were, and many people who would see very clearly and try to do things about it. But there were other people who were trying, who were holding on to whatever was the most important to them. And it could be a person, it could be memories, it could be work, it could be a lot of things. So you, you just talked a little bit about what's going on in the world with COVID and Black Lives Matter. Jack hid his face for a really long time in the book. I mean, really uh, almost to the end. And so do you think that with the uptick in anti-Semitism, both in the United States and abroad, that people are, are more likely to hide their faith? Do you think that what's going on in the world kind of makes people weary of really sharing who they are, what they believe in, what they stand for? That's a great question. I think that one of two things can happen, and I based this particular aspect of Jack, I based actually on some things I learned from my father. My father grew up in a very observant Jewish family. And he was a little rebellious, you know, he was, he was more questioning. Um, he was a mathematician. Um, and when he got out of uh, the Navy, he was looking for jobs and he said that he realized quite quickly as a Jew that there were certain whole areas of business that were completely closed to him. Banking, completely closed. The white shoe law firms, the really top level law firms. Harvard had quotas, Princeton had quotas, Yale had quotas, you know, Cornell, I think, was the only Ivy League school that let Jews in without a quota system. Uh, he couldn't get a job in advertising. That was also considered a very white Anglo-Saxon. So he went through a period of wanting to change his name and wanting to pass. Now, his father had come over very young and was a doctor and had, had, had been one of the principal founders of Mount Sinai Hospital. So his entire identity was based on being Jewish. So, you know, there was no way that my father's father was going to change the last name of the family. So I think that those are kind of the two poles, the people for whom being Jewish was extremely important and an extremely rich part of their lives, either as a cultural identity or as a religious, uh, an article of religious faith. I think those people became more proud and more um, clear about, about being Jews in the same way that we saw in Philadelphia after the shooting at the synagogue. You know, the, the people in that synagogue really rallied and they, they said, you are not going to drive us out of our place of worship. And people more like my father Who, who did not have that spiritual sense, who, who had not grown up particularly religious, when he found that the cultural identity of being Jewish really wasn't working very well for him when he was trying to get work, he wanted to pass. And, you know, it, it, when I first heard those stories from my father, I was... It's a little bit like you, Hillary, like, I don't know, you know, is that, and, and I've heard other people say this, I've had this question, like, is that, is that accurate? And, and in fact, it is. The anti-Semitism in America was, I, I'm going to, look, we did not take people to concentration camps. However, we did turn away the SS St. Louis the boat that was filled with Jewish refugees. 
and we did it very consciously. Everybody knew who was on that boat. We did not bomb the train tracks leading to Auschwitz because it was not a strategic target. The rally I describe in Madison Square Garden absolutely 100% happened. And it was true that the ACLU and, and the mayor said, you know, there's, they haven't done anything wrong. The best thing is just to expose these people for who they are. Well, I don't know, that sounds a lot like the New York Times saying, of course we published Tom Cotton's editorial calling for the police to mow people down in the streets. We'll just expose him for who he is. Well, at what point are you propping up that I belief? And, and at what point are you just being impartial and saying, well, this is happening. We have a, you know, we have a duty or responsibility to report it. The rally happened. There were no, the only person who was locked up was a Jew who ran onto the stage trying to protest. None of the, the Bund was, was locked up, none of the Nazis. So, you know, it, Henry Ford, and, and I mean, I think a lot of people do know this, but Henry Ford published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. And he ran a column every week. I wish I could remember the name, the exact name, but it was basically the, the problem of the Jew, how Jews are ruining our society. It, you know, this was a column in the front page of, of the newspaper. So, and, and Hitler thanked Henry for it. I mean, they, they were good old pals. He let, he let Ford plants be used for German manufacturer, for German manufacturing. So, you know, there was a lot more going on in the United States than we like to believe. And I'm a little bit of a contrarian, I think. I, I, I always want to question the sort of established beliefs. And there is a belief that the U.S. was this white knight, you know, and we swooped in and won the war and, you know, rescued the Jews. And it's more, it's more complex than that. It's a lot more ambiguous than that. And I wanted to show that on, I think, on both sides, or tried to. What was the most difficult thing about writing Jack as a character, as, as someone of the opposite sex? Did you find that difficult? I didn't. <laughs> I mean, he's the character who developed the latest in the, in the story, I will say. The, the German part of the story, because so much of it was based on research, it just, it presented itself more quickly because, because there were all of these touch zones for it. Jack was entirely made up. Um, complete figment of my imagination, although there were so many military investigators sniffing around Los Alamos, the FBI, people working for General Groves, CIA, OSS, I mean, they were all there. So it was not, I didn't make that part up. But in the initial version of the story, Jack was more of a vehicle to kind of let the German story unfold. And then I realized, oh, this is, a, it's going to be a lot more interesting if Jack has his own secrets. And she's so sharp and so strong and so, you know, so quick. She needs somebody to bounce off of. And she's not going to let this guy just you know, interrogate her and spill her all her story. She's going to make it as hard as possible. And it'll be a lot more interesting if she if she starts to suspect some things about him that turn out to be true. And I also felt like, you know, I did not 
I did not want a romance in the classical sense between Jack and Hannah. But there is something on Jack's side about if you have been hiding your true identity and this brilliant and beautiful woman unmasks you and sees who you really are and accepts you for it, you're kind of in love for the rest of your life because we all long to be seen and he's got layers and layers and layers of fear and insecurity that have, you know, given him these masks. And when she peels those away and says, I, I still think you're a good, decent person. I, I see you and I still like what I see. It makes a different kind of love story. Um, and I liked, I liked that. What's the most important point that, or points as the case may be, um, that you want people to get out of this story? I think the most important point, I would say there are two and they kind of work together. One is that um, there is this extraordinary woman who really did exist and that it's incumbent upon us to start finding these women and telling their stories. And in my case, I feel also getting them the recognition that they deserve and telling their stories is one way to do that. But I think the other thing that was equally important is that in the end, what this boils down to is one woman and the strength of her faith and love making an enormous difference in the course of history. Because if Hitler had gotten the bomb, we would not be having this conversation. Do you, how do you think um, sci uh, female scientists are, are still not getting their due respect? I mean, there's, there's difficulty for women getting into any kind of science and, and there's all these STEM programs. But how, how do you think Hannah reconciled or Lisa reconciled the fact that her work killed a lot of people? Well, so the quote that I opened the book with is from, from Lisa Meitner herself. And I think it speaks directly to that. Um, Those blessed with a brilliant mind and a gift for science have a higher duty that comes before discovery, a duty to humanity. Science can be used for good or evil, so it's incumbent upon the scientist to ensure that our work makes the world a better place. So that's what Lisa would say. And I would say that one of the reasons I put her as a character at Los Alamos was to show the difference between a woman who had gone through an experience in Germany where she had actually seen what happens when pure science is militarized, when literally, you know, suddenly the, the, the SS is marching into the Institute and saying, this is no longer an independent Institute. It is a, it's an army facility now, and we are working on weapons and only weapons because that did happen. That's exactly what happened. So she saw that in stark, you know, in very stark uh, picture to put her then at Los Alamos where the same thing was happening, but it was happening on a much subtler level where the scientists, all men, I will say, except for, except for Hannah, are so enthralled by the power of discovery. And, and this I also took from interviews that I had with some of the scientists who were there 
in Oppenheimer's inner circle. And there, there is also a wonderful documentary that has a lot of the ones that aren't with us anymore. And they all, to a person, talk about the fact that when they realized that Hitler did not have the bomb, which was on VE Day, they all say, everything I know about myself and my morality says I should have turned around and walked out of there and never looked back. But I didn't, and none of us did. We needed to know if this was going to work. And so I put Lisa there in a way to show those two polls, if you will, because it, it, is, it is a question we are going to live with forever, you know, is how these discoveries, these scientific discoveries are used, how they get politicized, you know, that, that's a different side of the COVID conversation, but do we listen to the scientists? Or do we listen to the people who really think, let's open the economy because that's far more important. So, you know, this is, I don't think this conversation is going away. So I wanted to show that, you know, that, that there are people with, with moral principles that they, that they hang on to that can see more clearly, perhaps, than the names of the people who we've credited you know, whether it's J. Robert, J. Robert Oppenheimer had, had massive regrets, but it wasn't until after the fact, right? I mean, he had massive regrets almost the moment after, but not before. And so, so that was something I was very interested in exploring. And I felt that that, that was a testament at least to the idea of, of Meitner that I, that I found in that particular quote. Maybe even though they were so smart and they, they figured out how to, to make this bomb, maybe they really never thought it would either be used or, or work to the effect that, you know, their, their um, planning had thought. Well, it's interesting because a lot of things that are in the book were actually based on things that happened at Los Alamos. So for example, there was a petition. There were concerned scientists um, who were circulating a petition that many people signed and they were having meetings to lobby to have the bomb demonstrated, you know, to literally invite you know, the emperor of Japan or the general, uh, you know, and the Soviets, if necessary, out to the desert and to conduct a demonstration. And Oppenheimer said, as he says in my book, but what if it doesn't work? We will lose all credibility. Also, because they had never tested it until Trinity, they had no idea what was gonna happen. I mean, literally, it could have been a total dud. It could have dropped and just fizzled. Nothing, nothing could have happened. But they were also taking bets about how big the explosion was gonna be and how much destruction there was going to be. And Enrico Fermi did bet that it would incinerate the entire state of New Mexico. And one of the other scientists, I think maybe Teller, thought it would incinerate the Earth's atmosphere. And yet they had soldiers, you know, uh, half a mile away, a mile away, so they could see the effects if it did work on these soldiers who were, you know, super close. And they literally were putting sunscreen on and wearing sunglasses because they didn't know they really didn't know. And that's fascinating. You know, we know now, but imagine going and preparing for that day after, you know, years and years up on this mountaintop 
with people not knowing what's going on and what you're working on, and you have one shot. And it happened to be raining. There happened to be lightning, like <laughs> hitting like this close to the bomb casing. I mean, it's insane. It, it kind of does have to be a movie because it's such <laughs> an amazing scene, but you know, we'll see what happens. That, that, that was one possibility. of the, that was one of the questions. <laughs> I think it'll it'll turn into uh, a screen, you know, screen uh, play and, and off to the the film. So that'll be exciting. We'll be able to share it at the JCC Chicago Jewish Film Festival when it comes. Yes, to yes. Well, there we have is, a couple yeah. couple more minutes left, and I just wanted to see if anybody in the audience had uh, any questions, you can unmute yourself and, and ask them now. Raise your hand and unmute yourself. Yep, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, uh, well, I, I wrote it in, but I guess, I don't know, it may not have gotten to you. I, I'm not really all that adept with Zoom, but um, I was wondering if you, uh, Jan, uh, are familiar with the uh, John Adams opera, Dr. Doctor Atomic, and if it influenced you and how it influenced you, and also the character of the General Groves. You mentioned something about the, you know, the struggles between the scientists and the military, and I wonder if you could talk to that a little bit, because sure. I was very moved by that opera. Uh, I thought it was just an incredible piece of dr drama. You know? Yes. Um, so, so here's how long I've been working on this project. The play Copenhagen opened in the middle of my research, right? So I went to see it because it got great reviews. And I was sitting in the audience because I was thinking, is this going to destroy my project? Because, you know, it's been well received. And, and, and actually, I remember sitting in the audience and thinking, actually, no, I think this is good for my project. Because the truth is, this is so obscure that if people are liking this play, I think they're going to love the book. <laughs> Although that, at that point, I wasn't sure it was going to be a book. And then Dr. Atomic I heard about, I was still working on, at that point I'd written a number of drafts and I flew up to San Francisco to see the premiere precisely because I wanted to, you know, see it. And it was very moving to me as well. Um, and I thought that, I mean, for me, that, that, that tension between Groves and Oppenheimer, it's, it's a love affair. It's two people who are like a Hitchcock film, you know, like 39 steps, they're handcuffed together in history and you couldn't find two people who are more opposite and yet you know, Groves was the one who knew immediately that Oppenheimer was the only guy who could do this. And I ended up, and I hope this comes through in the book, I mean, Groves was, he was tough, um, he was foul-mouthed, he was, he was big, you know, he got things done. He had a mission, and that was all that mattered. But he had to navigate because these scientists, they were all crazy, you know. They were all communists, or most of them were. Um, and Hoover was there going, what are you doing? I mean, Oppenheimer is like a, a, a communist. How can you put him in charge of this mission? And Groves is like, well, you know, if you find a Republican who's a brilliant scientist, let me interview him, but this is the guy. And so he saw something in Oppenheimer that I think Oppenheimer didn't even know he had at that point, this ability to kind of hold people together, you know, lure these top geniuses to, the, to this mesa on the mountain and keep them there. Um, and massage all the egos, you know, and keep everybody working. But, you know, there were things like, 
Hans Bethe, who was uh, sort of the top level mathematician, you know, Groves wanted all the scientists to wear army uniforms. And Hans Bethe, I mean, I think Oppenheimer had been fitted for a uniform and he was telling Beta that he was going to go in and get fitted for a uniform. And, and Beta said, I will discover the atomic bomb as a professor. I will not discover the atomic bomb as a lieutenant. I mean, because for him, it's like as a professor, he could justify the work because it was science. But as a military person, he could not justify doing it. So there's Oppenheimer trying to ha have to manage his scientists and then have to report to Groves who had to manage Oppenheimer. I mean, it was a, it was such an intricate dance. And I didn't get to spend a lot of time on that relationship in the book because that's not what the book is primarily about but I did find it fascinating and I hope I was able to crystallize some of those, the tension, the admiration, even the love and the conflict and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, the odd, odd couple story of those two, you know, Oppenheimer was in fact 95 pounds at the Trinity test. He weighed 95 pounds and he was 6'3". Oh, and wow. they, they said he survived on cigarettes, coffee, and martinis. And Groves was this big, like, you know, I mean, you would sort of say, what's he doing in the military? He looks really kind of out of shape. He wasn't, he wasn't pudgy all over, but he was like barrel chested, you know, and he had a lot of like power in his body. And they're just, you know, fat man and little boy are the names of the bombs, but they're kind of also, you know, these two weird, like one tall scarecrow and one fire plug. So. And th this has been, uh, I'm so lucky that I get to read these books and then meet the people who write them. It, it's a really great perk of my my job and I'm so grateful that we were introduced to you and that you were able to share this story with us we Thank are you. out of time unfortunately I feel like we could go on for another hour oh, Susan had a question too that's a that's okay <laughs> that's my mom for everyone Hi. who doesn't know that's my mom I'll, I'll get to her I'll get to her but Thank you so much. This really was fascinating. And please stay in touch with us. If it goes to a movie, we want to premiere it here in Chicago. Okay. For everyone else, thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website, jccchicago.org. June and July, we're filled with many more authors coming to share their stories with us, along with some Monona, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright visits and some other potpourri of things so again thank you jan so much for your time everybody thank you so much have thank a great day stay well and good questions thank you bye